country and dialect. It's not an accent, it's not a Spanish, it's a dialect. And that's an important distinction. It has its own system of grammar and vocabulary. It is essentially a 1,000-year-old form of spoken English dating back to the Kingdom of Mercia, the largest and wealthiest central kingdom of the Anglo-Saxon world. As a result, a lot of our vowels are back palatal, lots of as and as and us. A lot of our eyes are interchangeable with ours, so you can have an apple in your hand to get them on. <laughs> on his ass. Now, do you think it would be a good idea if we should broadcast some useful black country phrases? For, yeah, for tourists, a sort of lonely planet guide, or lonely planet uh, guide. OK, some black country phrases. Repeat after me, if you please. Gizu, mama! Gizu, that means, go for it. Um, give it some welly uh, for the southerners. Phrase number two. You know the game. <laughs> that means you know the score. You understand what's happening. Um, a useful one for any of you at home who actually ever visit the black country and talk to any of us. Uh, <laughs> oh, oh, you know the game. <laughs> <laughs> the dialect largely survives in the form of jokes. We have all these traditional black country jokes performed in black country dialect. Um, for the sake of, and I cannot emphasize this enough, culture, let's give the world some traditional black country jokes performed in black country dialect. Here we go. A little wench, little wench sat on a wall, and it got a whammel here. As an uncle's walking past, and it says a little wench, this is a whammel, and it goes, does you have a dog bite? <laughs> little wench says, no. So mum goes over to her, bends down, strokes the dog, he bites her! And says, I thought as you said as your dog died bite. Little wench says, ah, oh, that I'm our dog. <laughs> Give it to my man! <laughs> you know the game. You want to know what kind of place the black country was for a little punt like me growing up? I'll give you an example. I was once on a cross-country run at school. No countryside involved, obviously, as it was a black country. Running along the Compton Road area of central Wolverhampton, wearing my grammar school emblazoned standard-issue PE kit, little white thin T-shirt with little thin white short shorts, trotting along at the back with all the other tubby wheezers. <laughs> when this car pulled up alongside us, going <laughs> boots, boots, I was like, oh, God, here's trouble. And they, they wound the window down and started going, <laughs> I smell that, fuck you, I got <laughs> And I was like, oh, God, just ignore him. So we'd run on for a bit, but then they'd just speed the car up and keep pace alongside us, going, oh, do you slow I up? <laughs> And I was like, oh, God. And then I heard him going, oh, George, George, George. I looked in the car, it was my family. <laughs> I love my family. <laughs> big fan of my big fam. Anywhere between nine and 14 of us in the immediate fam, which may explain why I enjoy being alone so much. Um, and they all help raise me in their own special way. Um, chiefly, I was raised by my lovely, amazing parents, obviously, but also by my grandparents. Well, nothing unusual about that time of the place. And a lot of that was done by my granddad, my dad's dad, my grandfather. My granddad is an amazing man. He's the hardest working man you'll ever meet in your life. He's a bricklayer. He's been a bricklayer since he was 15 years old. He's the biggest family man you'll ever meet. He was born to a single mother along with his twin brother. Didn't have a surname till he was nine, because that was just possible back in those days. <laughs> <laughs> Very well dressed. Takes a lot of pride in his appearance. Always wears a shirt and tie, flat cap, brogues. Very mind he works up a scaffold. From the ground up, he looks like some sort of duke. He just got lost and just accepted his fate and joined in. Just trailing it on, going, Oh, no, I used to own Northumbria. Um, and I idolised him when I was a little kid. And I shall say for why, and I don't want to make no generalisations or cast no aspersions or nothing like that. But when I was growing up, yeah, boys emulated and admired men who were hard, massive, good at fighting, good at football, although my granddad was very good at football, as I'm sure he'd want me to point out. Three <laughs> goals in three minutes for Willow Town FC, 1956. Look it up. <laughs> <laughs> I idolised him because he was kind and generous and funny, and everybody in the town knew him and loved him and respected him, and they'd always say, oh, he's a gentleman, now, yo, a granddad. You're a gentleman, yo, I'm getting... And I was obsessed with that word, gentleman, because I thought, aha, there's a niche. I can feel, because it might not surprise you to learn, that I wasn't massive 
and I want no good at fighting or football. <laughs> so the gentleman, little gentlemanly uh, model of masculinity seemed like something I could aim for. And I was very lucky to have him as a role model in that way. And he's been a huge inspiration to me and to all of us for all of our lives, really. Um, but I wanted to kill him every single day when I was growing up. Um, <laughs> I wanted to physically murder him with my bare hands. Uh, I'll explain why before you think I'm the worst grandson in the world. Anybody here grow up in a house with people who did a manual job of work? Yeah. Yeah. Right, right. Well, then, if you did, you'll know that the worst time of day in the house is the morning. Why? Because parents and grandparents who do a manual job of work get up at piss bastard o'clock <laughs> every day to get as much work in daylight in as possible. Five o'clock in the morning, nothing unusual about that. They'll get up earlier, though, if they also happen to keep a massive pen full of pigeons <laughs> at the bottom of the garden. Because as well as being a bricklayer man and boy, my granddad is also a champion pigeon flyer. He'd have to get up earlier to get down the pen and feed the pigeons. So his alarm clock would go off. I'm going to say quarter to five, and let me set the scene for you. Grandad's bedroom at the end of the landing, bathroom at the other end, in between our bedroom, four boys, two sets of bunk beds, in between the bunk beds, a cage with a dog in it. <laughs> Staffordshire Bull Terrier called Buster. R.I.P. <laughs> His alarm clock would go off, and it was one of those uh, proper old alarm clocks, like a lizard tongue in between two boobs. I don't know how else <laughs> to describe it. And it would go... <laughs> insanely loud. Like, <laughs> that would go off, that would wake the dog up. The dog would panic and fart. <laughs> the dog would fart, and that would be my alarm clock, because I was on the bottom bunk. <laughs> Then Grandad would get up and clomp down the landing to the bathroom, blomp, 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 wash his face with a big bar of imperial leather. <laughs> so you're nice and awake now. And then he'd clomp, blomp, 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 down the stairs to the kitchen, turn on the radio, and he's, he's fairly hard of hearing. He's a virtue working next to a pneumatic drill for 60 years. So he'd turn on the radio, it's about nine billion decibels. It'd be, the voice of Wolverhampton is the voice of traffic. Oh, traffic on the country road's absolutely terrible today! <laughs> then he'd be whistling. <laughs> Compulsive whistler, my granddad. Always whistling. And all of this would wake up the minor bird. <laughs> Everyone know what a minor bird is? Yeah, yeah it's like a knockoff parrot, basically. <laughs> Would just go, whip, whip, <laughs> which is the minor bird equivalent of just sitting in your house going, ah! <laughs> ah! <laughs> so all that noise is going on, <laughs> whip, the voice of um, and then he'd grab a big bag of pigeon seed, two ton, <laughs> onto his back, brum, 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 through the house. French doors and up the garden going DDD, -de -de, always singing DDD, -de -de, that famous hit from yesteryear, DDD. -de -de. <laughs> and he'd go up the pen, down the pigeon seed, and <laughs> open up the pen, all the pigeons covering their eyes going, oh my god, what, what time is it? Then he'd get a gardening glove and a big cash and carry sized box of Walker's crisps, and he'd bang them together. And the pigeons would all go, mother of God, and then <laughs> fly up out the pen. Then, at last, the pigeons will go vroom, back into the pen, pick the seed back up, dee dee dee, back up the garden, dee dee dee, up to our bedroom to wake us up. Oh, cheers! I'd have slept in else. <laughs> now, in the interest of BBC balance, my granddad is sitting just there. So we just thought we'd ask him just to see. Would you say that's a fair description of what it was like? I would say so, George. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> there you go. I'll tell you something, though. We deserved it. <laughs> Why? Because we were the worst behaved four children ever to live in the history of the planet. <laughs> we were just always pranking him. There was the basic stuff. Like, we'd wait till he was reading his paper and one of us would silently commando crawl across the living room floor 
all the way up till we were level with him, then we'd rise up like a swamp monster and just bang the paper out of his hand. Express and star up the wall. Cafe creme up the wall. Uh, that's the cheap cigar, not a latte for any of <laughs> people listening. I need to go, right, will you lot pack it in? And just chase us. Bum, 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 bum. Or he used to have an upstairs phone and a downstairs phone and <laughs> We'd wait until after we'd gone to bed and he was watching telly and we'd ring him on the upstairs phone to the downstairs phone. I'd be like, pop, 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 pop. Hello? He, he, he. Hello, is this Asda? Do you sell any bums? What are you up in the But it was all worth it because every Saturday morning, without fail, we'd go and have our breakfast, or as Grandad called it, our breakfasts, <laughs> at McDonald's. <laughs> yeah, cheer for McDonald's, the plucky underdog. And <laughs> <laughs> we'd walk there. Um, because my granddad couldn't drive and my uncle, about ten years older than us, who also lived there and drove the van, would be too hungover from a rave up Cheeky Monkeys the night before. <laughs> so we'd get up in the usual horrifying fashion, go out into the garden, through the back gate, which let us onto the green field that backed off the steel plant behind our house. <laughs> um, then we'd cut across Fibbersley, parallel a new slime, past Waddensbrook and out onto Steel Park Way, which was the main artery running up to Bentley Bridge, where the McDonald's was. On this 20-minute stretch of walk, Grandad would see approximately 7,000 of his friends. <laughs> mates from the pub, the club, from work, from pigeons, shouting at each other across what was essentially a dual carriageway. Like, <laughs> All right, Bill, I'm you going? <laughs> <laughs> OK, not so bad. <laughs> All right, Arch, you got the top before me. I'll bring you down next week. Even the caretaker in the McDonald's was a mate of his. <laughs> All right, Chief. Working hard, are you? Oh, not as hard as you. I'm working with the foul babby skin. Yeah, 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 no, thank you. <laughs> then he'd send one of us up to do the order while he chatted to him. Just look, a five-year-old just toddling up with a 20-quid note. Um, then we'd have our four big breakfasts. <laughs> then we'd have a walk over Wensfield way. And if you grew up in Wensfield in the 1990s, as I'm sure many of you listening at home did, you'll know <laughs> that the jewel in the crown of the town was Woolworths. Woolworths. Oh, do cheer, Woolies. We'd get in Woolworths and Grandad would give us our pocket money, a pound apiece, as he called it. Oh, give the babbies a pound apiece to get the suck. What? <laughs> <laughs> suck means sweets. <laughs> Next door to Woolworths, there was Alan Bennett's The Butchers. Yeah. It took me a very long time to realise that Alan Bennett the butcher and Alan Bennett the playwright and author <laughs> were not the same person. <laughs> Other side was Sketchless, the dry cleaners, which I mistook for an offbeat boutique for trinkets and curios because I couldn't figure out what they sold in there. And didn't that just appeal to my creepy little aspirationalism? <laughs> Felt like I belonged in there, socially. So I was quite put out when the manager threw me out on suspicion of nicking. <laughs> Madam, please. I'm just browsing. <laughs> I was ten. <laughs> Couldn't convince her I was legit. Even with my bow tie. <laughs> which I insisted on wearing to Mackey's for at least a year. <laughs> I will say, though, in fairness to that judgmental woman, I was an odd child. I lived in my own head, spent a lot of time in cloud cuckoo land. In fairness, everybody let me. I think they were just like, best place for it, mate. <laughs> um, I did the normal stuff, like, I'd be in the bath with my little bath boats, and instead of going, I'd be going, <laughs> Napoleon shot like claim to lead warrior! <laughs> Stunned by your guns, my heart's over. <laughs> like not to word on board, be spot. <laughs> Man, the rig in your scum, bling, bling, bling. Well, into the battle we'll go. All oh, hands on deck, let's show. George! Will you come out that bat? There's four more on us to get in there. I'm only joking. I was never the first in the bat. Oh, no. That's for Dad or Grandad, isn't it? Oh, what a splendid idea. Who shall be first into this tepid pool of still lukewarm water <laughs> we must all wash ourselves in? Why? Probably the quantifiably biggest, dirtiest, hairiest, smelliest member of the family, of course. Oh, lovely logistics. <laughs> This isn't always what I felt called to do, though. I did think, when I was in my late teens, that I was going to be a priest. Not 
a hot one, like in Fleabag. <laughs> Just one who actually does his job. Um, any religious people in? No, of course not. It's 2022. <laughs> I'm religious. Roman Catholic, thanks for asking. Um, half Church of England, though. Sometimes I secretly do wish I was full Church of England. Just for the hymns. <laughs> Church of England hymns are the most gorgeous, perfectly distilled English things. All Church of England hymns go something like... Lovely beef on a Christian morning. <laughs> Dew on the eyebrows of a vicar's friend. <laughs> the vicar on a bicycle, also playing cricket. <laughs> God has selected our nation alone for redemption. <laughs> oh. a bit of a U-turn at the end there. <laughs> Subliminal messaging. In the Catholic Church, we have Ave Regina Cellarum, Ave Dominum Cellarum, Salve Radix, Salve... Co it's not an earworm, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Lex Credendi, Lex Orandi, Lex Vivendi is an Anglican motto. The law of believing is the law of praying and the law of living. So the expression of prayer through song is vital, not only to the liturgy, but to a life lived in faith, which is why I believe there is no banger like a primary school hymn. <laughs> <laughs> Too many bangers to pick a five. <laughs> Any takers, best primary school hymn? Got the whole world in his hands. That is the worst one. <laughs> <laughs> that is the worst one. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. Go on. He's got the whole world in his hands. Oh, cheers for clearing that up. I never would have known what he's got in his hands. Here's a strong controversial opinion of mine with little to no hard evidence to back it up. I think that primary school hymns might be the only classless experience in Britain. Agree? Disagree? Don't matter, it's my BBC Radio 4 show. <laughs> Can't think of any others that unite absolutely everyone, speaking of someone who's moved through the posh echelons, the posh echelons, if you will. <laughs> I've got to do my disclaimer bit now, because we've started dropping the C-bomb. Class, not the other one. And I've got to be a bit careful there, because I think the issue of class and regions like the black country often get conflated, and one doesn't necessarily equal the other. It's easy to see why. The black country is a place with a very rich, deep, working-class heritage. But I've been exposed to way too much privilege in my own life to talk about that with any degree of authenticity. If you want me to talk about my own class, I will. It's perfectly simple. I was born to working-class parents who went on to have middle-class jobs and raised me aspirationally lower middle-class in an upper working-class community, sent me to a middle-class school, which led me on to an upper-class university, graduated with upper second-class honours from a world-class educational institution. On graduation, didn't have any of the middle-class fail safes and connections that many of my peers enjoyed, suffered a great deal with my mental health and fell back on job seekers allowance and housing benefit which temporarily requalified me as working class, particularly within the context of my middle class peers. <laughs> Worked a series of what would be termed working class jobs before I could get a lower middle class job teaching upper middle class students which allowed me to move back in with my by now middle class family shortly before they moved over to the upper middle class side of town while still maintaining all our close connections and relationships with my lower middle class and working class family. Perfectly straightforward. <laughs> Nothing to iron out for you there. My little brother, who's a lot wiser and more patient than I am about this sort of thing, said to me, why do you always have to bring class into it? It doesn't matter. It does not matter. The thing with you is it's always about identity. You've got to be this. You've got to be that. Why can't you just be you? And he's absolutely right. In an ideal world, that is exactly what should be the case. But this is the weird thing about social mobility, it forces you to constantly and comparatively reevaluate your identity on someone else's terms throughout your whole life. The thing is, I think in this country, no one is comfortable with the idea that prospect and prosperity should lift you out of your culture, right? Because that's wrong. But that's sticky because for white English people, and I'm being specific here with colour and culture, I haven't just gone full Tommy Robinson at the end. <laughs> for white English people, our class sort of is our culture. But that's sticky because class isn't a fixed cultural characteristic. There's an economic dimension to it as well. Like if you're a British person whose cultural heritage is from Pakistan, Ireland, Nigeria, Scotland, Lithuania, Wales, Poland, China, Jamaica, that identity is always there for you. That can't be taken away. Whereas obviously with class, it depends on your current circumstance and previous and future opportunities as much as where you're from and who raised you. It's all very messy. But if there's one concrete thing you can say about white English culture, it's that we've got a monarch. We've got the Queen of England. 
which means that we've placed someone definitively and unreachably above all of us so that every last one of us has no choice but to exist somewhere on a sliding scale between a divinely appointed person with a giant hat made of gold and diamonds <laughs> and a bin. <laughs> we have to be somewhere on that scale. And I wish I had something clever to say about it, some insight, some resolution. I've got nothing for you. I've got nothing for you. I've talked honestly but subjectively about my own experience here. That's all you can do, really. Only one thing I know for certain. These are divisive times we live in. Perhaps it's hard to pinpoint the reason why. Perhaps it's the last six years of lies, corruption, backbiting, social media targeting, hate mongering and manufactured culture worn by the people in charge to make honest people who disagree with their patently venal decisions feel like small, wrong, frightened traitors. I don't know! <laughs> My opinion on the matter is basically worthless and I'm not a good, honest, common sense, salt of the earth man of the people like the Prime Minister, for example. <laughs> but, but I do think it's plain to see that there are all these fences up between us now. Maybe the fences are new. Maybe they've always been there and we've chosen not to look at them. But there are all these fences up. And if you're a cheeky bastard like me, who's used to nipping through a hole in the fence, having a drink and a fag and a laugh on the one side and drinking loose leaf tea out of an Oliver Bonus teapot and singing in Latin on the other, <laughs> you suddenly find you're no longer able to do that. You're stranded on one side of the fence. And that can be hard when that world on the other side of the fence is disappearing because the black country is irrevocably changing, in good ways as well as bad. I, I, don't, I don't think anybody misses new meconiosis. <laughs> but that wild industrial landscape is disintegrating and blowing away, which is all particularly tough when that world was the landscape of your childhood, your imagination and every dream you ever dreamt. So what can you do? when you find yourself marooned on the different side of the fence to the one you started on. Well, what I've discovered is that you can take all these postcards with you from that world on the other side of the fence. All these postcards with images on them of memories and moments that remind you of the lessons and the ethics and the love that you had on that other side of the fence. And I will never forget where I come from and I will never really leave the black country, because I will always have the postcard with the image on it of a kind, generous, funny, well-dressed bricklayer stood in the garden on a sunny morning, looking up at the sky, watching his birds. <laughs> Before I go, I'll, I'll leave you with this. On my uh, A-level results day, I found out the same way as everybody that I got into university, hunched over UCAS uh, on a Dell, the laptop. <laughs> <laughs> and I was chuffed, obviously. My parents in the next door bedroom, pacing up and down, absolutely plopping themselves. I ran in and went, we've done that! And they went, yeah! And we all jumped in the car, drove into the centre of town where my school was, and as I pulled up to the front gates, my best friend was standing there with his mum and dad, and he'd got into the same university as me, and I got out of the car, and I was so excited, I was singing the You've Been Framed theme tune. <laughs> da 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 never figured out why. <laughs> da 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 and My friend went, come on! <laughs> Then we all went out to the lawn bit at the front of the school. And there was a photographer there from the Express and Star, our local paper here in Wolverhampton. And he said, uh, oh, can we have a photo with anyone going to the big universities, please? And we were like, that's us, lads. So we all had to jump in the air, holding our results papers up with our legs behind us. I was wearing a three-piece suit, starched collar and tie, and carrying an umbrella. So I just looked like one of those like paranormal photographs, where I was just a ghost, like, flying around the kids. <laughs> and as we all jumped up in the air for this photo, this dirty old transit van came burping round the corner and onto the Compton Road. And as it drew level with the school, they wound the window down and started going, Hey, brother! I looked in the van and it was my family. <laughs> it was my granddad on his way to work, building my history teacher's extension. <laughs> and as he came level with us, he leaned out the window and across this big posh lawn to me and my fellow posh overachieving kids, he shouted, Gee, it's your mama! <laughs> and I, without thinking, shouted back, You know the game! <laughs> and that is why it was the happiest day of my life. Aww. Thank you all very much for listening. I'm George Four Acres. Turn on a bit!